NBS Happening Now. the next nine nations do in terms of their spending on an industrial base. It gives you a sense of where the more powerful and potent medium to long-term economic multiplier is going to be. And it's certainly in the West, less in the West and more in the East. In terms of democratic and ideological tendencies, we see lessening affiliation with the 90s. We're seeing a drift towards greater levels of illiberalism, a greater level of intolerance, a greater levels of xenophobic tendencies in a variety of nations, a relative lack of accommodation of contrasting views. And this illiberalism seems to be taking place in an era where we have big men leaders, heightening levels of populism. When I say big men leaders, Consider Xi Jinping, leader for life, potentially, in China. In Russia, Mr. Putin, President Putin, likely to be in office until the mid-30s. You've got a strongman leader in Viktor Orban in Hungary. Similarly, uh, Erdogan in Turkey. And maybe the emergence of Donald Trump in the United States in his second reincarnation. So big men which offer populist projections and policies to their citizens that may not necessarily be enduring and greater levels of intolerism, greater levels of illiberalism. As I've said, the World Wide Web defined the last 30 years, but the World Wide Web is largely reaching maturity. We think that there's likely to be less impetus from the internet of things to drive growth. Instead, the combination of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, the metaverse, and also immersive reality technologies. We are witnessing an, a lurch into the unknown, an accelerating race into a technological unknown. We don't know precisely what the future is going to look like in terms of technological disruption, but we do know it's coming to us quicker than we ever imagined. It is possible that the next five years of technological evolution will be equivalent to the past 25 years of technological evolution. In other words, exponential speed with new tech that we are going to have to embrace, which both presents angst, but enormous opportunity, particularly for African nations that can leapfrog the more traditional bricks and mortar, the more traditional types of technology, technological foundations. In resources, we're shifting from abundance to scarcity. Not just scarcity, for example, with regard to rare earth metals or the technologies needed for renewable energy, but also food scarcity. And that is partly why we've seen food inflation so heavy in many markets, so elevated in many markets. And of course, climatic challenge is also threatening food production and food security. We're shifting from dirty energy to clean energy. A one in a 100 year episode in terms of structural change, in terms of energy drive, the shift from carbon based to renewable energy, as I've suggested, for the first time in 100 years, a seismic level of new amount of investment and new adoption of technologies with regard to lessening the global carbon footprint. An immense opportunity, both in terms of investment and an opportunity for bringing energy to markets that have been bereft of energy, particularly on the continent. We're shifting from an era of big wars I did not want to write small wars so as to diminish and make light of death, even during smaller conflicts. But tension, as we've seen in terms of a Cold War tension between West and versus East, 
between continued attempts at modern-day, Latin-day colonialism in certain markets of Western hegemony and Western military strength attempting to assert itself across the world is part of it. And it ties to the confrontational stance in the very first point that I made. Over the last couple of years, we've seen ideological drift towards what some people will call wokeism. Very left-leaning ideologies permeating society. But now there's a retreat. There is a resistance, a more conservative voice beginning to emerge against woke ideals. In fact, some would say that Trump's popularity, even if he wins or doesn't win the United States elections, his popularity is because he appeals to a conservative American base who are still rooted in conservative ideals and are threatened or feeling angst with regard to this more liberal wokeism that has been thrust upon society in recent years. But that, as I said, was my first introduction, and I'll be a little bit more hasty now, was just to give you some sense of the more structural, epoch-inviting, era-inviting changes. It's bigger than just talking about cyclical growth. The second chapter, and here I'll be quick, I just wanted to show you some images of the continent that perhaps you've not seen, and they present a few in interesting insights. This is Africa in terms of population density. In other words, where do we reside as Africans in terms of people per square kilometer? You can see very much North Africa, the lighter shades, the reddish to orange shades where people are populated. You can see the density along the, the, the Nile, an almost whitish image showing you the density and the proximity to water bodies from the lower parts of the Sahara, Senegal, all across Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, up until Cameroon, and then sort of in an arc shape, East Africa, down to the southern parts, the southeastern parts of South Africa, and even a density in Madagascar. I describe our distribution almost like an arc, an arc, as I said, from Western continental Africa in an arc shape all the way down to the southeastern part of South Africa. And I want you to just kind of cling to that notion of an arc in terms of our population distribution on our continent. You can see across the Sahara and the lower part of the Sahara, the Sahel, quite shallow in terms of population, obviously, because of its dryness, its intense heat. So we're drawn to bodies of water, either lakes or to coastal cities. This is rainfall. The dark blue area shows where there's more rain, sort of more abundant rain, and the lighter shades of the image show you where there's lesser rain. Now, I know if I were to say Kenya, Tanzania, and sometimes Uganda tends to be a lesser rainfall area, you would challenge me, especially given the abundant rainfall in certain parts of East Africa earlier this year. But relatively speaking, you can see far more dense rain, Cameroon, Congo, the DRC, um, and also Guinea and those areas. But you can see there's another almost arc shape in terms of lighter rainfall in this particular image. It's interesting if you look at the African dispersion of forests. Forests are more heavily located where there's more rain. So the lighter area on this exhibit shows you where more dense forests, more dense production of oxygen, and lighter, relatively lighter levels of forests in that arc where there's less rainfall. And note, it's also where population density is more heavily distributed. This is an image of croplands. We grow crops where we reside. That arc image of population density is more or less mimicked in this image. And notice there's a little bit of a contradiction in the sense that we, we, are, we reside near bodies of water, ter ter terrain, terrestrial water and oceans, but we're also growing our crops where there is less rainfall 
relatively speaking. And that also speaks to the precariousness of our croplands, the dependence on rainfall for irrigation, and especially the dependence when we know that 90% of African agriculture is rainfall dependent. Put quite simply, we reside where there's less, less where there's less rainfall, relatively speaking. We grow our crops more greatly dependent on rainfall and precarious rainfall, and it speaks to the vulnerability of our, our rainfall. The next image I'm showing you relates to livestock dependency. Um, I hope you can still see me because uh, for some reason my screen has has faded and I'm sure someone will just tell me through Teams if it's all good. Because I think I've, I've, um, I've struggled for a moment, but I hope you can still see me. Okay, all good. So uh, what I'm showing you is livestock dependency. Thank you for that all good message. Um, what you're seeing now is livestock dependency. And it's just, um, in a sense, mimicking the agricultural or the, or the, um, the earlier exhibit. You're coming to near conclusion. These, this exhibit you're looking at now is shipping lines. And it just shows you the shipping lines which envelope the continent. Uh, a fair amount of shipping lines that passes through the southern part of South Africa, or the Cape of Storms, as we call it. But you can see the very light images on North Africa. So the Gulf of Aden, the Suez Canal, the Mediterranean, the astonishing level of transportation lines that, um, that, tra that, that provide shipment from west to east, from the United Kingdom to India and further on for that matter. Of course, because of the inflamed tensions in the Middle East, we've seen an increase in shipments passing through Southern Africa. In fact, during the first half of this year, and especially the first quarter of 2024, shipping movement, container shipping movement, passing the southern parts of Africa increased by up to 50% for obvious security and safety reasons. This is carbon emissions, and it mimics the population density image. In other words, carbon emissions are where we reside. The streaks that you see across the Sahara Desert, the Sahel, that just gives you some sense of airline traffic and the carbon emissions distributed in that respect, which, as we know, tends to be quite heavy. Let me turn very quickly to the third element I wanted to visit with you, and this relates to external trade. Now, with respect to external trade, what we're looking at here is just simply imports as a proportion of GDP. If you look at East Africa, you will note that it's sort of mid-range in terms of, you know, 20 to 30 percent of the equivalent of GDP accounts for imports. Imports is about 20 to 30 percent of GDP. In other words, what this image shows you with respect to Africa, and especially East Africa, is the high import dependency of our broader region, particularly given the absence of heavy manufacturing. However, if we look at exports, here you see, and for example, a moderate level of, of exports with regard to the East Africa region. Let me go back to imports for a moment in case I didn't linger too long there. Imports, as you can see, between 20 to 30 percent import dependency for East Africa. But exports we lighter in East Africa. In other words, exports typically account for 10 to 20 percent of the equivalent of GDP. And the point that I'm making here, quite simply, is that especially given that Uganda is on the cusp of a very significant hydrocarbons era, the litmus test will be to harness the opportunities born of hydrocarbons and to allow it to spill over into an elevated level of industrialization. In other words, it cannot be that the hydrocarbons industry is the first and last tonic for Uganda and the region more broadly, but it becomes a transmission 
sector for further industrialization and the elevation of the services economy that will be founded on further heavy industrialization. And I think that just speaks to the export orientation opportunity that beckons over the next couple of years, and dare I say decades, for the East African zone. I'm going to be a little bit rushed, and I'm going to just talk about now the next chapter would be economic growth. And I want to talk about economic growth within a more distributed sub-Saharan African context. The exhibit you're looking at now, if you look at the image on the left-hand side, it gives you a sense of economic growth in a variety of maybe larger African economies. And it shows you two things. One is that over the first part of well, the first decade of this century, the early 2000s, well, you know, roughly from 2000 to 2014, you had generally synchronized acceleration, generally synchronized, consistent, positive economic growth. But the second meaning from that image on the left is that you will notice the oil economies on Western shelf of the continent performed relatively better. Nigeria and Angola were growing in the very high single digits for perpetual number of years. And in fact, they carried the sub-Saharan Africa growth. Ghana was above the sub-Saharan Africa, same with Uganda, but Kenya was beneath the sub-Saharan Africa, and the same with South Africa, beneath the sub-Saharan African average, even if we were all above the global average. Something different happened over the last roughly 10 years. The oil economies of the Western Shelf of the continent began to recede. Their oil dependency weighed on them. The lack of diversification hemorrhaged their economies. And now we see, for example, Nigeria and Angola at the more low to mid-single digits at best. Whereas East Africa, high single digit growth for a length of time. One of the points I make is that in a rather odd way, East Africa would be considered to be non-resource dependent. In other words, lesser dependent on the mining sector and more diversification in terms of its economic breadth, which is different to Nigeria and Angola. They tend to, tend to be monoline economies, very dependent on oil with very little diversification. So you could almost argue that East Africa, generally speaking, has benefited from decades of non-resources dependency. It's been a gift. They've not suffered a different curse, a resources curse. And now with resources coming more to the fore in the next few years, that resources, to my earlier point, needs to be harnessed for the continued industrialization of East Africa generally and for layering the services economy, whether it is accounting services, legal services, tourism, hospitality, for that matter, those need to be amplified across an industrial base founded on resources as a means to an end rather than resources as an end. South Africa also has been an economy over the last decade in Malays. In the early 2000s, South Africa mustered 45 to 5% growth. In the last decade, it has been unable to consistently do better than 1%. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But this exhibit is just to show you growth rates across Africa. On the left-hand side, the map shows you for this year, and on the right-hand side for 2025. What stands out is our estimation of the fairly giddy growth rates across the continent in the vicinity of 5% and above, 6 7% for East Africa. So the promise and the consistent contribution of East Africa to Pan-African growth or even Sub-Saharan Africa growth will be the outstanding feature, at least for the next decade, and something to be cheered. Now, I did say that I would conclude and introduce South Africa as the final installment of my visit with you, but the idea that there's a very strong correlation between South African growth and Southern African growth. Put differently, 
If South Africa is growing at 1%, which is what it's been doing in recent times, it contributes 0.7 of a percentage point to the neighborhood growth. If South Africa were to get to 3% steady state growth over the next couple of years, which we envisage, then that will contribute two percentage points in terms of Southern African growth buoyancy. Over the last decade, South Africa's growth has followed more or less what I call an arc. In other words, we had fairly elevated growth and accelerated growth in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Subsequently, from around 2008, South Africa experienced a slide in its trend rate of growth. So that arc image, if it were an emoji, it would look like a frown. And I would argue South Africa had four chapters of political economy history. Nelson Mandela gave us reconciliation. He allowed us to believe that we could have a shared prosperity across race groups, across ethnic groups. Former President Thabo Mbeki solidified South Africa's institutional fabric. By institutions, I make reference to the judiciary, police services, investigative bodies, prosecutorial agencies, just generally speaking, the rule of law and the political center held. During the former President Jacob Zuma era, our institutions that are the guardrails of society collapsed. And with it, the rule of law, and with it, broad impunity. It's no surprise that as we butchered our institutions, our economic growth collapsed. If I leave you with my visit today with just one message, if you were only were to recall one thing, I would leave you with this, and it is the lesson from South Africa. 75% of the explanatory power, the formula for growth, is the rule of law. Many economists, many policymakers are surprised when I make this statement. Because ordinarily, we're guided to believe that capital plus even innovation causes growth. Capital in the form of human capital, physical capital, financial capital, plus innovation. When you meld it together, you get growth. And that's true. But we argue that capital plus innovation will only account for 25% of the growth equation. 75% hinges on the rule of law. When South Africa butchered its rule of law, economic growth floundered. And there's evidence from more than 150 countries around the world that confirm the rule of law is the foundation stone for sustained and perpetual economic growth. You could throw all the capital and all the innovation on an economy that has no rule of law, you will effectively be throwing capital innovation on quicksand. It will not prove enduring. And South Africa now is in a stage of reform. It's in a stage of rebuilding our institutions, our rule of law, our governance under incumbent President Sir Ramaphosa. We think that from roughly one percentage point growth in trend over the last couple of years, we are in advanced stage of repairing what was a very fractured power system. And we think our electricity system will contribute over the near to medium term 1.3 percentage points to growth. Our logistics network, particularly rail, was also severely impugned over the last couple of years. And that is in the early stages of recovery and repair as well. Over the next three years, we think that a repair in our rail system under the ban of Transnet, our national rail operator, for goods and people, will contribute about 0.7 of a percentage point to growth. And then we think other reforms like visa reforms, the cost of doing business improvements, will contribute about half a percentage point to our growth. So in three to five years, we think we will accelerate from one percentage point steady state growth now to approximately 3.5% growth. And we think that will in turn buoy sub Southern Africa by an additional two to 2.4 percentage points of additional growth in the neighborhood. And hence why I thought I would introduce South Africa to this conversation. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I've come part to the monologue, the formal part of my presentation. As I've suggested, five themes that I wanted to share with you. And if I could just conclude by revisiting those in summary. It is not just cyclical, cyclical change that we are embracing. In this post-COVID world, in an era where we're shifting from the globalization and geopolitics of yesteryear, the type of world that the youth are going to grow up with in the next 20 to 30 years is going to be remarkably different to the type of environment that many of us slightly older individuals were party to over the last 30 years. Different level of rest, restlessness, a different level of aspiration, and a different level of geopolitical conversation requiring a very different level of leadership. The second image, the second theme was just to show you the continent in a, in a perhaps a far more charming, seductive way, borderless. Third point was just to show you an export orientation for East Africa is kernel to continuing to buttress industrialization in that particular economy, and in fact, across Africa. Fourth was to celebrate East Africa, from Ethiopia all the way down to Mozambique. Our sense of Standard Bank is that the eastern corridor of the continent is going to be a vector of economic growth over the next decade to come at the minimum. And then lastly, after malaise or for at least a decade, maybe 15 years, South Africa seems to be bottoming with better socioeconomic prospects likely to occur over the near to medium term. And that perhaps is a good story for the region in totality. Let me stop there. I'm going to stop sharing now as well in terms of the presentation and PowerPoint content. Um, I seem to be having a little bit of digital failure on my side where I can't see what you're seeing, but maybe you can see me uh, and I can then defer back to the room. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gulam. Africa in a new age, a new era. I think this Gulam deserves another wonderful round of applause. <laughs> Gulam has taken us to the, across the continent and brought us back home and showed us a couple of prospects that lie within our borderless opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to move on with the program. But just picking off from Gulam's presentation, a couple of talking points, the geopolitics. So the question then is, how does a farmer, a coffee farmer in Uganda get affected by the ESG or energy transition concerns? How does a bakery in Kawempe get impacted by the geopolitics? Well, as you all know, a lot of grain comes from Ukraine and Russia. And therefore, for that baker in Kawempe or Boise or in the up market industrial production areas, this is real. This is much closer to home. It looks abstract when you talk about transition to clean energy, but if you put it into perspective, the EU recently passed a legislation that restricts access of commodities that have been grown in deforested areas. Now, that doesn't sound abstract for a coffee farmer in Uganda, because that means if your coffee is being planted in deforested areas, then you're going to have a lot of challenges getting your commodity access into the EU market. Technology. Gulam has touched on that. Logistics. 30% of the global logistics moves through the Suez Canal. We have transporters in the room. How does that impact on your business the moment you see conflict, geopolitical conflicts and tension between Israel, Gaza, and that impacts on the cost of risk premium in terms of goods moving through this channel, and ultimately the cost of haulage of consignments across the oceans and into Uganda. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to move on to the conversation, and we're going to break down the symposium talk today, or the conversation in the room, into four key themes. The geopolitics, debt, transition to energy, and technology. And at this point in time, I would like to take the occasion to invite our panelists, 
The next session will be moderated by Daisy Nitwe, our Stanbeck Bank country lead for structured solutions. I'd like to invite Daisy on stage. And as Daisy walks on stage, I'd like to introduce the other panelists and also invite them on stage. I'd like to invite Christopher. Christopher is part of Gulam's team, so I'm sure he has more to unpack for us. Chris, you're most welcome. And he sits in Nairobi. Now, from the private sector, we have Joseline Kateba, the managing director, Crest Foom. Joseline, you're most welcome. Happy to have you in the room. And then from the central bank, we do have Dr. Adam Mugume, Executive Director of Research, Bank of Uganda. So as you can see, we have a very well collected, selected, very knowledgeable panel of panelists who are going to be assisting, assisting us in the next one hour to unpack these themes. And like I said, these are not abstract. If you thought these were abstract, you need to rethink because these are much closer to home transition to clean energy, geopolitics, technology, and debt. And as they prepare to get their seats, just to touch more on what Gulam did hint on, a new era. It's so exciting to look at the immense opportunities that lie for Africa and for Uganda more specifically. And one key takeaway from Gulam's presentation was resources not as an end, but as a means to an end. We are getting into fast oil a few months down the road. The question in the room, will resources be an end for us or a means to an end? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning once again, and welcome, a warm, warm welcome, a blue kind of welcome to this panel conversation. We've called you here a number of times before to this very room, and when we did, we called it an economic forum. And so we focused our conversation on interest rates, on exchange rates, on inflation, and on growth. We've seen the need to understand that by the time interest rates change or shift, a lot has been happening in the background. And so the conversation today is really to say, how do we get a hold of the shifts in this economy just before they actually land, before you start to see them in the price of goods from the supermarket next door? Peter Drucker, a renowned management consultant, did say, and I quote, the greatest danger in times of turbulence is not the turbulence itself. It's to approach it with yesterday's logic. And this is the premise of this conversation. To say that we've done the same things over and over and over. But Gulam has highlighted about eight or nine things that are potentially shifting the global economy. And every single one of us operates within this economy. So it's to say, how will these things land? Because by the time they land, it's probably too late for you to make any amendments. So our conversation today is to focus on two things. One, to shine a light on some of these shifts that in the course of running your business, you've probably not paid attention to. But the second part, which I think is actually the more relevant one, is to say that some of these, these things you've heard before, you've heard about technology, you've heard about energy transition, there are some key buzzwords but they seem abstract because you don't know how you get to land them for your business. And that's what the distinguished panelists will help us to bring home today. So if you'll allow me to use the next 45 minutes or so to listen from these brilliant minds, and then we'll engage it in a Q&A. So in the next five to seven minutes, I'm just gonna start by asking each of our panelists, if you could please highlight, Gulam has gone through a very fairly different but insightful presentation. If each of you could please highlight for us what stood out for you, and obviously why. 
Uh, Dr. Mugume, if you please allow me to start with you. Of the things that Gulam has mentioned could affect the global economy and by extension our own economy, what stands out for you and why is that what you think we must go away with today? Thank you so much. I think he has highlighted the, the things that we are grappling with. Number one, on mainly on uh, uh, something that uh, we had forgotten about in our literature about uh, industry, uh, industrial policy, reemergence of industrial policy of 1960s and 1970s and 80s, where we saw countries doing what we used to call inward-oriented policies, where you are protecting your industries, you are restricting trade, uh, putting on different sorts of uh, reasons to why to restrict trade. And I think this is something that is disturbing. And un unfortunately, even when uh, the Europe does or the Americans do such a kind of uh, industrial policies. Also back home in our African countries, we tend to copy. You start looking at also, remember the, what we used to call import industrialization, import substitution industrialization strategies. Uh, but that is good, but can also be distortion. And I think that's what we are seeing. And if you see the global uh, statistics in terms of trade, you see that all of a sudden the trade is shrinking, and yet global trade is shrinking, yet normally global trade is an indicator of the global growth. So, and I think really that's one of the things that is, uh, uh, is hitting. And the question is, if this uh, continues, and then African countries copy the same, where do we end? Do we go back to 1960s and 70s, where each country was saying, you know, I have to protect my industries, restrict trade? Mm. Uh, I think that is really a big, a big, a big challenge. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mugume. So, from Dr. Mugume, it's industrial policy, and whether we need to be revising that. Uh, Jocelyn, if I could please come to you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Daisy, and to the team for inviting me to this panel. Um, I think in Gulam's presentation, what really struck me was his uh, choice of words. He talked about seismic change. You know, he used that very, very dramatic um, phrase, and, I, and I, you know, I, I agree with him that the world that we have been in and what has been in the past is not clearly going to be where we're going. But I think as a, um, a player in the manufacturing sector, I think what that sort of um, triggered in my head is this whole concept around, you know, we hear words like VUCA, volatile, very uncertain, complex, ambiguous, you know, times that we're in. And the challenge that that also spills over for us is, you know, we like to plan ahead. Yeah. Um, typically when you are you know, an investor, whether you're in the agricultural sector or manufacturing or even in oil and gas, you know, you, you, by the time you think about an idea and then you think about the time it takes to execute on that idea, there's a time lag, right? Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about, you know, tremendous change is, is kind of what we're seeing in the new era that he um, proposed, the challenge is when we arrive and are ready to go to market, are we going to be out of sync? You know, he mentioned, you know, um, I think it was uh, the, the moderate, the, 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 the gentleman earlier talked about how the European Union, for instance, is saying if you have coffee in areas where you've cut trees, that will not be welcome in that market. So, you know, it takes a couple of years to grow coffee, just to give an example. The same is true when you're putting a plant into execution. So I think there's that issue around, you know, how shall we make sure that whatever we're doing is in sync with what is needed at the time it arrives to market. Mm -hmm. And then there's the other issue around, you know, when we go to finance, uh, we, you know, one of the challenges we have in industry is that we have very short options when it comes to long-term financing. So when this environment is what we're expecting, then we are looking at potentially, you know, um, having more 
challenges going forward in terms of how does one even understand you know, those long-term projections? How do you price for them? Will there be availability for financing? So again, you know, a lot of, um, I guess it struck a chord there and a lot of uh, things to think about in terms of, for those of us who have a long time, lead time in terms of idea and execution and how do we plan going forward. Okay, so we've got industrial policy and now I'm hearing volatility yeah. between when you start on a concept and when you actually come to market with it. Um, Christopher, if I could please get your highlight as well. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be on this panel. Um, the, th the things that struck me from the presentation were, uh, one, when Gulam talked about um, moving from resource abundance to resource scarcity. And the reason why I think that will be something quite critical for our region is uh, if you think about the size of our, the demographics at the moment, we, East Africa has around 330 million people, estimated to, to, to reach around 500 million people over the next decade. Um, so how are you going to feed these people? Um, such questions come, come to mind. Um, and thus the need for our countries to invest in securing um, supply chains, in increasing ag agricultural productivity, in ensuring that we have sufficient job opportunities for the young people that will be coming into the, the labor market. Um, so I think that for me um, is something that uh, came up uh, when I listened to um, Golam's presentation. Awesome. I think for me one of the things that struck when he spoke was that the amount of investment that the U.S. is putting into the economy on military is quite significant. But more importantly, when we shift away from the U.S. and we look at China, China is putting in a lot more to grow their economy. And he seemed to suggest that that might be why we see a shift um, from a global dominance perspective from the West into the East. And that's probably where I want to start this conversation at, to say that if we look at China and the amount of focus they've put on Africa, take for example, if we look at FOCAC, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, there's been nine summits. If we compare that with the US, there's only been two, and even then it's been in a space of a decade. The first in 2014, I think the next one in 2022. If we look at it from a trade flows perspective, and I'm, and I'm really trying to put my mind around who really is taking global dominance, is it China? or is it the US that we've known traditionally? So if you look at it from a trade perspective, at $280 billion annually, China is four times, China's investment in trade in Africa is four times more than that of the US. If you even go a step lower and look at it from an infrastructure spend, I've seen some of our contractors in, 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 in this room. China has about 150 billion into Africa compared to a an even more dismal number of the US. So there's something about China that China seemed to be saying to Africa, and there's something that we are saying. The challenge that I want us to get out of here with is to say that how do we take advantage of this shift? So Christopher, if I start with you, how do we get to a place where we know that East Africa has a place in this shift, shift, shift in you know, how things are happening? So how can East Africa position and because this is a business forum, how can our clients sort of align themselves to tap into this that's happening? And I know most of them do have business and linkages with China. So if you can just give us some context on that. So I think um, it was also touched in the presentation, the fact that if you look at external trade um, from East Africa, imports uh, account for around 20 to 30 percent, while exports around 10 to 20 percent. So my sense in, to, to answer your question, uh, Africa needs, or East Africa needs to position itself uh, to export more, um, to try and in increase the business opportunities with the East and also with the West, um, take advantage of the abundant resources that we have. If, if you think about the oil developments that are happening in this country, the potential for um, um, liquefied natural gas in Tanzania, rare arts in Kenya, I, I, I think that there will be tremendous opportunity um, to, to position our regions, not just on a resource base, but also when you think of the demographic I mentioned earlier, uh, 
we, we have, if you think of the East and, and the West, aging populations, youthful population in Africa, how can we uh, provide that resource to the rest of the world? Um, so my sense is we need to think about that. We need to think about economic, uh, increasing the economic complexity of our economies um, and means, and from that, uh, when we increase the knowledge that we share or the educational levels within our uh, East Africa, you, you sh that will help to increase that economic complexity and we'll be able to tap into the opportunity that uh, China is pro presenting to the continent and also um, to some extent we are seeing the West trying to come back to, to, to recapture what they lost. So I think by increasing export orientation, by finding ways to send more of our youth to the East and also to the West, um, that will enhance um, some of the, uh, uh, this opportunity that we see from, from China and also uh, from, from the US. So I think my sense is we have, in a multipolar world, you, you, can, you have more options. Um, and I think that's the opportunity for, for most entrepreneurs. It's not in, like in the past when uh, you could only say, um, we'll focus on the West. Now you have the East, you have India emerging. Um, so there is more multiplicity of opportunity for, for, for East Africa, uh, more markets to, to tap into. I think one of the things that I like to look at is that we have the resources that China is looking for. Maybe there's a policy gap that needs to be bridged in terms of how do we get access to sending out some of these things into China. Um, and, and hopefully Dr. Adam along the way will touch on that, but if he doesn't, it's probably one that we're going to take away to say how do we actually look to do that. The challenge that if you are a policymaker you start to face is that there's also a sect of economists that assert that Chinese support into our economy in Uganda or even in Africa, if you look at it from a continent perspective, has come with a fairly heavy debt burden. Um, and, and, and if you look across the continent, we've had a number of debt events or even restructures or debt defaults in some. If you look at Ethiopia, if you look at Zambia, and even more recently, Ghana. But I just want to bring that closer to home and say, if we look at Kenya, we had the June 2024 maturity that sort of made a bit of headlines in, in, you know, in the market. But even away from that, we are likely to see Kenya get a downgrade from the rating agencies on the economy, a third downgrade in a space of just two months. And because most of our fortunes are tied to Kenya, we have a number of businesses that have linkages to Kenya. We also have a number of businesses here that have actually expanded into Kenya. I'd like to know, Dr. Mugume, from where you sit, how do you expect that everything that's happening in Kenya might impact us as a country? Are there any policy sort of um, moves that are being taken to safeguard us? And then maybe we'll get into how that might affect borrowing costs for everybody in this room. Well, I mean, when your neighbor is affected, when your neighbor is a, has a problem, obviously it feeds into, uh, into your own household. Mm. But again, we have to take it to, uh, into perspective. I think uh, Kenyan challenge is uh, completely different from our side. And I don't think uh, Kenya, although the bonds are now called junk, but I think Kenya is on, uh, on a strong footing in the sense that, well, it, ha it could have had challenges in paying the, you know, two, uh, two billion dollars worth of, uh, of debt maturities, it is safe. But I think it was really not to that extent of uh, being downgraded to a junk or to uh, that kind of state. Because the fundamentals for Kenya are really strong. They are really, really, I don't see anything apart from the politics of it. I don't think really Kenya is really has a weak, really weak fundamentals that we could be uh, uh, fearing. The second thing is Kenya is, is politically sound. Uh, and so normally it is a combination of poor governance and then the macros that distort the economic fundamentals. So in the case of Kenya, therefore, we don't think really there is something that could fundamentally shift Kenya that can really uh, uh, spill over into Uganda. Now, coming back to Ugandan side, we all have borrowed. I mean, there is no country that doesn't borrow. Uh, the Americans borrow by printing their own dollars because they have the, do they have the, the global printer for the dollars, okay? For us, we can't print Uganda shillings 
to buy uh, to buy a tractor or to do a lot. So that's where there is a difference. So all countries borrow. So the question is really the, uh, what you are doing with the borrowing and are you growing the economy? Mm. So going back, and I think that was clear from the presentation we saw, the economic growth are pointing to a positive. So the ability therefore to borrow and repay are really not really uh, naturally affected. We could have bumps in, on the road, yes. Could have a situation where you have borrowed and uh, constructed a road, but probably the returns for constructing that road are not really uh, you know, uh, coming. That's what we call uh, you are f borrowing to do a non-tradable good. You are increasing non-tradable by borrowing, and therefore you have a problem in debt servicing many when it is external. So really, and he's cutting across many countries, it is true. In Uganda, uh, we seeing you know, uh, challenges in terms of uh, data repayment. Not necessarily there could be bumps here and there, because for example, this year, we have a debt service of around $1.3 billion uh, you know, uh, for this year alone. And uh, a bit of that is Chinese, obviously, because they did the road ZTC. So, but I don't think really that is a, should be a big challenge. Can it be a challenge in one year or down the, whatever in the course of the year? But overall, I think uh, with the good of economic fundamentals, with the uh, pro, uh, you know growth that are pointing really positive, I don't think we should get worried about uh, uh, the challenges of debt servicing. I guess that's a bit reassuring that whatever is happening in Kenya, even if we're watching it very closely will not exactly kill our economy, will not kill our economy, if I hear you correctly. But also to say that even with all the debt concerns that we have as a country, the policymakers are on top of it. And the reason that's important is because when we look at um, policy direction in terms of rates, it does have an implication on our borrowing rates. So if CBR, the central bank rate, is starting to go up, we expect that your borrowing rates will be revised accordingly. But from what you're hearing from Dr. Mugume, it does look like this is well under control and maybe no cause for concern. And we'll take any questions that you might have. I, I want to pivot a bit and move into a fairly different theme, which is energy. Energy transition or ESG, some of the things that we've heard a lot on the streets. Climate change has made energy transition completely inevitable. We cannot ignore it. And unfortunate for us, even if as a continent we don't contribute significantly to global emissions, nowhere, on the, nowhere in the world is the impact of climate change more felt than on the African continent. And because of that, we've got to be seen to participate meaningfully in energy transition and in making it more, more acceptable and more supportive of what we're looking to do. So, so best off of that, and I want to come to Jocelyn on that, when we speak energy transition, how, how near is it to your business, really? Are there any actionable steps that, maybe not even in your business, but you've seen being taken on in businesses or things that people in the room can start to consider from an energy transition perspective? Yes, this is an, a very important topic because I think all of us have heard about ESG and, and how you know, this is becoming a very important um, area that we must look at. Um, and, and, you know, there the are different angles that come with it, or should I say pillars, that are pushing on this. So from where we're seated in business, um, there's the regulatory aspects. So you see this, and when I say regulatory, I'm talking about your NEMA, as an example. Um, to some extent, actually, the UNBS, uh, our factory just went through our annual QMAC certification. And in there, you have aspects around how do you deal with your chemical waste, how do you, you know, make sure that your impact on the environment is, is being taken care of or, or mitigated? And then you have, you know, areas when you think about the, um, the financing sector. You know, when we go to fund our businesses, you typically start to see a growing um, uh, ask around what are you doing on the ESG side of things. And, and that is actually becoming louder. I think it, it wasn't that loud a couple of years ago, but I feel like in recent years that's becoming very, very clear. Um, and then also on the customer side, so we talked about the EU, you know, imposing that if you're cutting down trees and planting coffee, then well, that will not be welcome into the EU markets. But we are also seeing it, um, you know, from the side of uh, our business when you go to tender. So when I fill in a tender form for especially the, um, 
the expected suspects there would be, of course, the multinationals or the, the NGOs such as the UN, or if I'm doing a tender for World Vision. But interestingly, I've started to see with some pre-qualifications, um, you, you know, companies that are, organizations that are like the, um, the schools where oh. we typically will be targeting to sell our mattresses. In a lot of when we are putting our submission documents, you're seeing an ask around, can you tell us what you're doing on the um, environmental, what certifications do you have? So to bring it a bit closer, just I wanted to paint that picture and just say, you know, there is kind of a louder voices coming in from all these different angles. And then of course, as a business, you want to be a good global citizen. You want to get awareness that this is something that is really important. The next step is, you know, what are you going to do about it for yourself? So you have your own strategic plans that you put in place. I'll bring it to our company and sort of our, what our journey is. And it is really an ongoing journey uh, where we started, you know, paying more attention was when we started looking at our ISO uh, 14001 uh, Environmental Management System Certification. We were able to actually get support from GIZ, courtesy of UMA, so to other manufacturers out there. Um, you know, sometimes some of these certifications can feel daunting or, you know, just understanding where to start from is always a challenge. But that is why we have associations such as the Uganda Manufacturers Association to guide you on how others have started that journey and also the support that is available. So we did that, got GIZ to, to fund a grant for us, and we got consultants in. And then we had the beginning of the journey where, where you, you deal with kind of, um, you know, an, a, an overview of where you are. You know, what is your environmental footprint as an organization? Now, as you can imagine, so I'll just give you a, a quick one on this one. Um, mattresses are actually made out of material that is from petrochemicals, you know. So whatever you're sitting on right now, those cushy cushions that you have, you have some bit of dirty energy in there, just so you know. Um, of course, there are options, and we have also paid attention to, you know, what are the trends in our sectors around, you know, coming through with biofuels. What could, what could that look like? But the challenge that you quickly come to realize is that where the biggest proportion of your, especially as an industrialist, environmental impact is, where, where if you want to make changes, there's a huge investment change that has to happen. I'll give the simple example of a car. If you wanted, as a person, an individual, most of us in this room are driving cars. If tomorrow you wanted to have a, a lower carbon emission, as an individual, contribution to the environment, it would mean you'd have to change that car. You'd have to get either a hybrid car, or electric car, but then there are a lot of implications around that. So you have to fund that car. Then, of course, there's going to be all the other issues around the enabling environment. Where are you going to power that car? And how far will it take you? So in short, I think um, when we did our, our uh, assessment of as a business, our economic footprint and the changes we would have to make, we quickly realized that there were certain things that would mean we would have to change our entire plant, mm. as an example. Mm. Um, and that, that alone is now you're talking millions of dollars, then you start looking at, okay, what are the other ones which are low hanging? And so that's where we probably in our journey have focused our efforts. The first, of course, was like I said, getting that certification so that we went through having very clear um, things of measure that we're saying, okay, we're going to put targets and, and try and get those reduced. So things around paper, you know, we have our ERP system in place, so we cut down on the paper. We looked at recycling. Recycling is actually very big in manufacturing, but can be very broad. In our case, we did put in a plant um, with the help of UDB uh, to help us to recycle some of our waste so that we could actually minimize those non-biodegradable um, components being put in, in the environment. So mm -hmm. the, the point here is there is a lot of work and there is a lot of um, you know, thought that has to go into it. I'll just finish on the plant one. So, we, we, they are alternatives to petrochemicals for the usage of, 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 if you want to use as inputs to make foam. However, the challenge is, what is the readiness and what is the quantum of supply to then support you? So it's, even if I had wanted to put in a new plant tomorrow, where am I going to source those inputs oh. that can, and, and in what, um, how much will they be? Where will I source them? Do you have the quantum? Has that investment downfield been done? And, and so there's all those 
issues that have to be sorted. And then the last one I'll finish with is, what is the readiness for the consumer that I am serving today? Because I am in a low developed country where the consumer is paying attention to price. So a lot of times when these you know, energy things come in, then you have the technological aspects to support them. And then now you're talking about additional costs, then all of a sudden, are you able in the market to actually find a market for this. Mm -hmm. And so you find that a lot of the um, green mattresses, an example being a rubber mattress sold out in California, the price tag, I'm sorry, I don't know how many people in this room could afford it. Yeah. And so ultimately, those are some of the challenges that we are battling with. But for sure, we start with the low hanging and, and our journey has been one to get certification, like I said, supported with um, you know, the, the, the players in the market, starting with UMA, and the second one is saying, okay, there are different things you could do differently. So we have even contracts with companies like the West that come and take our chemicals and actually deal with those hazardous materials separately from just disposing them into any rubbish pit. So we take the low hanging and continue to monitor, but um, it's an ongoing journey. Thanks. I think what I hear from you is that there is benefits to getting into the... Um, Trans energy transition, even the ESG journey. And because we're sitting with business people, what, I, what would be on my mind if I was in this audience is to say that for all this investment that I'll do to transition into you know, cleaner energy or any such thing, what, what benefit do I have? After how long do I start to touch this? You know, do I start to see the fruit of my investment? At what point do I see a return on this investment? And I know that Bank of Uganda, um, um, in conversation with the UBA, has come up with a framework for ESG, and I know that some benefits do exist. But maybe, Dr. Mogume, if we just take something from you, are there any incentives that you're considering either to the banks to enable ESG lending, such that even when somebody's taking a decision to say that I'd like to invest one or two, three things um, in this transition story, because ultimately it's good for my company, but it's gonna cost me today. So is there any incentives to say that when you get this, maybe there's a subsidy on your loan, or maybe there's some type of recognition or reward that you find? Sorry. Go for it, Jocelyn. Sorry, I, want... I, I beg to just um, finish my submission on this particular piece on the benefits. Yep. So the first benefit, and on, on one of the big things that we're seeing is, if you can demonstrate oh. that you have put in quite a lot of effort in being more corporate responsible towards the environment and sustainability in general, what it does is that it sets you apart from your competitors. So that is the first benefit. You remember I started by saying when we go into tender, some of the um, uh, documents that we are required to, to put in are related to that. The other thing that we're seeing, if you look at the export market in general, you hear words such as traceability and, and the important to, importance to get even certain levels of certification to access and even have a premium. And actually in those export markets, you can sell those products that are coming from places where you, know, you have demonstrated very good care mm -hmm. and sell them at a good premium. So you might not necessarily, that might not apply to selling them here in, in Uganda because we are LDC, but when you're looking at the target markets and where we want to be as a country in general, having um, and demonstrating you know, a strength around ESG, whether it is sourcing financing uh, or, or actually sourcing markets and at a premium, you, you quickly can get some of that return as well. I just wanted to finish with that. Thanks. Yes. Um, as, a, so, as banking industry, what Bank of Uganda did was to first issue the guidelines that the banks would follow or originated financial institutions would follow in terms of really uh, putting in the risk, the risks that come from climate change. So our approach has been, yes, first give the, the guidelines, but we believe that the guidelines will not be, you know, we may not necessarily drive the, the change uh, uh, very fast. So there is a sort of that probably we need a, both a carrot and a stick uh, in, in this, <laughs> uh, really to move fast. Mm. A carrot, if you uh, don't change, uh, you know, the way the banks are lending to particular entities, that are polluting environment, uh, and then well, as a regulator, you have to say, okay, what stick do I use in this case? We have given you the guidelines to follow how to put in the risk aspects that are coming from climate. The question we have been uh, discussing is what 
what stick can we use? Could it be, for example, don't take it from me that we are saying that, could it be the case that if you find a bank that probably is not buzzed about climate, we increase its reserve requirement, cash reserve requirement, compared to the other one, does behave differently? I see we have been uh, uh, discussing on that kind of arrangement to see whether we really we can use a carrot and a stick at the same time. But lucky enough, most of our banks actually have been quite sensitive. Actually, most of the banks have moved faster than the central bank in terms of really taking on uh, the climate, uh, climate aspect. There are very several banks that have moved very fast, pricing in climate uh, risks uh, into the pricing. If you are a polluter, uh, I think in some of the banks you see that actually the interest you are charged could be much higher than, for example, if we are uh, 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 dealing with aspect of uh, we are uh, putting in climate, uh, climate risk into the pricing. So we have already started seeing that, but I think it's still added to see really how do we move. I know we are also in touch with the uh, government, also another arrangement to have a countrywide kind of framework including green bonds that would be, uh, could be coming later alone, uh, you know, some years ahead, or even if not this year. But we are looking at a, a holistic kind of framework where we use a carrot, where if it is necessary, we use a stick, and also government coming on in some of the aspects, uh, like green bonds, as I said. Um, thank you so much. I think if I quickly pivot out, so what I, what I sort of pick is that there are some benefits that accrue from being able to transition into clean energy. But maybe there's a place for us, even as a bank, to start to articulate those to our audience today and you know, to a much wider reach of our clients. Um, I've heard, for example, that there could be some subsidies on loans if somebody is you know, investing in a green. There's a lot more access to financing from that perspective. And I'm going to just quickly go back into debt. And Chris, if I come back to you, one of the bigger problems that we have, borrowing from Gulam's conversation on sovereign debt and, and government debt, one of the other challenges that we're faced with is that we have a big portion of government revenue going to service debts. When that happens, we are eating into the pocket of development expenditure. And the private sector here starts to struggle. It starts to be a conversation of what's available to pay my areas, what's available to invest in, you know, enabling infrastructure for some of these businesses. If we could please draw from your Kenya experience, what have you seen to be the direct impact of high costs of debt service to businesses, maybe private sector or businesses in general? So in Kenya, what we've seen over the last, I would say, five years has been, um, as the debt service has increased, I think it used to be in the region of 30% uh, to ordinary revenue. Um, today it's at 60, meaning that every 100 shillings that the government uh, collects, 60 of that goes towards debt service. Now, the consequence of that is we are seeing less investment by government in uh, development um, initiatives. Uh, just recently, we've seen them also cut development expenditure further. Um, so in the, we, initially, it was in the region of 5% of GDP. It's now slowed down to around 3% uh, percent of GDP. Um, government has struggled to pay suppliers. So we've also seen in the same period over the last five years that um, not just because of the slowdown in government spending or in, in, on the development sector, but generally because of COVID and the cost of living crisis, that pending bills have increased. Um, at the moment in Kenya, they stand at around six billion uh, US dollars. And government is struggling to, to pay these arrears. So in addition to a heavy debt burden, um, government is struggling to pay uh, suppliers that they contracted over the last decade. Um, on the private sector side, uh, the private sector has been what has been driving the Kenyan economy. But given the elevated debt levels and the fact that the um, central bank has had to restrict uh, or tighten its monetary policy lately, we've seen private sector credit growth shrinking. And from conversations and also anecdotal surveys that we do at Stanbic, uh, we've noticed that the um, the, um, I would say the sentiment 
by the private sector has continued to, 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 to decline. It's, uh, we usually conduct monthly PMI surveys, and over the last five years, what you can see is that the level of optimism has, has declined um, relative to, for example, what I see here in Uganda. Uh, if you look at the optimism that business people in Uganda have compared to the optimism that Kenyan business people have on their economy, um, you can see the gap is close to 30%. Mm -hmm. where people are very optimistic here in Uganda about the prospects of the economy, while the prospects for the Kenyan economy have declined quite considerably. And that reflects the fact that cost of doing business has increased. Um, the interest rates at the moment are quite restrictive, so businesses are delaying investment decisions until uh, you have favorable conditions. So you are seeing... Um, when you have elevated debt burdens, uh, that the private sector also uh, begins to slow down um, because oh. the, the environment becomes quite difficult to operate in. Um, so th I think that's the risk that we face um, within, the, within East Africa, that if um. we borrow quite aggressively, you, you will, over time, constrain the ability of the economy to, to expand. Oh. Um, thanks, thanks, Chris. And I think staying on the topic of... Um, Borrowing. I'm going to quickly come back to uh, Dr. Mugume, specifically to cover some of the macros that concern Uganda, which is a very keen interest to everybody here. The shilling has been very, very resilient, at least um, in comparison to its sub-Saharan African peers. We've seen appreciation where we didn't expect it, where people called for depreciation. We've seen the shilling surprise us in many ways. What are some of the factors that underpin this strength? And how sustainable is it? Sorry. Uh, you, you have hinted on it. Yes, Uganda currency has been remarkably stable. <coughs> Even to our own surprise as central bank, incidentally. <laughs> Let me be frank on that one. <laughs> but there are two main aspects that we saw which we never anticipated. One, we saw good coffee prices helping us, uh, you know, in, uh, in getting good proceeds from coffee. Mm. And I think we have just ended the, one, the first season of coffee. That helped in terms of real inflows. That helped the, uh, the, uh, to stabilize the city. But on the other hand, remember that we tightened monetary policy for a while. Remember, we first increased the CBR from 9.5 to 10.25, uh, 10 in addition to increasing CRR, or what we call cash reserve requirement, also from 8 to 10. Uh, and I think you saw that from uh, last uh, 2023 to date, actually most of the banks were access, uh, accessing Bank of Uganda money, what we call standing lending facility, which used to be not to be the case. So to me that liquidity was very, very tight in the system. So to buy dollars, you require shillings. So if the shilling is not in, is it available, automatically restricts a part of the demand also for, uh, for the dollar. So that is on the monetary side. The other inherent, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, just comes as, a, as, a, as an, off, an offside kind of thing, is the fact that also government expenditure was probably more on the dollar side. You have uh, the government expenditure equivalent around the six trillion out of uh, uh, the budget that was going to the debt service, which was in dollars. So normally when they are, do, uh, when they are doing debt service like in the fiscal, uh, last fiscal year, they give Bank of Uganda the shillings, we give them the dollars. So in the process, therefore, once they have mobilized the shillings from the taxes and they pass it over, they no longer spend the shillings. So it is a withdrawal from the system. They give the central bank to get the dollars. That also restricts the liquidity into the system. So a combination of that, therefore, helped in terms of real stabilizing the, the shilling. Are we likely to see the shilling uh, uh, remaining where it is? For now, number one, yes, we are off the coffee season. We are looking at the new coffee season, uh, probably towards the end of the, of the year. We know that 
uh, coffee in Vietnam is likely to be affected, which is uh, robusta coffee. Uh, Brazilian coffee is recovering a bit. So overall, the coffee prices could remain strong, therefore helping our inflows on that angle. We also see that, again, government is going to spend more on uh, debt servicing uh, in the course of the, of, of the year. So on the liquidity injection side, ETC, we don't see to see a lot of liquidity coming into the system. And so, and then you have also global interest rates that are easing. So once the Fed rate comes down, obviously the offshore guys whom we, are, we had started seeing exiting, probably we believe they will start uh, coming back into our domestic market. So that combination seems to be giving us a, a more favorable outlook in terms of exchange rate, that probably the exchange rate may not uh, continue depreciating the way we had in, in, some time back, like towards the end of 2023, uh, we had anticipated that probably by now the shilling would be in the range of 4,000. But you can see that now we are far, far below. We are talking about 3,700, uh, 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 20 to 50. So automatically, is it likely to appreciate? It's still too early to say. But I think I would go with stability that the currency is likely to remain stable given the global development, given the coffee prices, given also the inflows we are seeing in terms of the oil investment and also other extractive industry, including gold. So given that, we believe that probably the currency would remain, likely remain uh, quite stable. Awesome. Um, Christopher, Standard Bank view on currency? No, I think we, we align with where the Bank of Uganda is in because, as you mentioned, coffee prices have been uh, quite favorable. Um, there was an expectation that as we get into the months of September, you will have a bit of dividend repayment that happens around that time. Uh, but despite that, um, we do anticipate that the currency will remain steady at around 37 to 3,800 levels uh, between now and year end. Awesome. So if I hear you correctly, we all are expecting stability on the back of... Um... Yes, uh, so we anticipate stability on the, on, on the back of positive uh, FX inflows um, and also um, the right level of um, central bank policy stance that will remain quite attractive uh, for foreign investors to come in. Awesome. Our time is very fast spent, and if I see the questions that a number of you are posting on here, they are mostly related to currency and interest rates. So I want to quickly close it here just so that we allow enough time for Q&A. But as a way of accountability, when we come to these gatherings and we have these conversations, we usually sort of leave some things that we know will really, really happen or we expect will happen such that when we next gather, that's where we start from. So I'm going to ask our panelists, if each one of you can please just, in your closing remarks, just tell us the one thing that you want our audience to keep an eye on, and then we'll quickly go into Q&M. If I could please start with you, Jocelyn. Um, the one thing, I'm just thinking quickly. I think... Um, you know, there was a lot that we, that Golam shared with us, and it's really hard to choose just one. But I think maybe we'll start with where my initial remarks were, just around, you know, this very um, volatile, you know, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous environment we're in. And, and maybe just the, um, the implication from that is, is more kind of short-termism, if we could call it that. Um, because really the truth is when we we are in that sort of environment, it's, it's really hard to forecast beyond kind of your short to medium term. And therefore, you know, I think from where I'm seated, I think it's more around more caution, um, simply because, you know, there's just so much that is unclear. I talked about you might put some, you know, we need to have investments because that's what drives growth. Um, but how we think through that and how we finance that, you know, has to have at least some level of patient um, patient capital in our case, because ultimately, you know, the shocks, should they be there, can actually leave some of us as players in a very, very vulnerable place. So I think for me, it's really just, you know, trying to get my head around, you know, this new era, as he mentioned, and, and sort of how to position, how to strategize, and, and really make sure we're making the right calls 
at the right time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Chris, if you could just get your parting. I'm looking forward to the progress that Uganda will make with regards to um, the oil sector developments. I think there's tremendous opportunity there, um, and not just for that sector alone, but then the multiply effect that that will have on other sectors of the economy. So that's something exciting uh, to look out for. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Mugume? Yes. Um, I tend to agree that the road ahead is bumpy, but quite promising also on the other hand. So it is a question of really balancing where I sit in the central bank. Yes, we believe the yes, short term could be more bumpy than the medium, probably long term. But normally when we talk long term in economics, we always say, but in the long run, we are all dead. So, <laughs> So the question, well, we tend to emphasize uh, uh, short to medium term. But overall, I think it looks really, really promising, although, again, as I said, the road is bumpy. Awesome. We will close it here. I'm just going to quickly summarize what some of the key things were. I think for Dr. Adam, what he implores us to pay attention to is really a change in industrial policy and the potential impact on growth, even elevated um, cost of inputs. Jocelyn, I think what I kept hearing was VUCA, volatile environment, and particularly challenging, where you've got to plan your long-term capital, which is probably a challenge you're living with us as a bank, as your bankers. Chris, resource scarcity, and how important it's going to be for us to secure supply um, lines, and also, of course, the position for exports. The more reassuring thing is that Dr. Mugume thinks Kenya's fundamentals remain strong, no emergent risk, but more importantly, Uganda then remains intact from an exposure to Kenya perspective. Uh, Josephine, I think on the ESG journey, she's also highlighted that we must stick to the low-hanging fruits while we consider the investment into energy transition. And business optimism, I think, is, remains key for, 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 from where Chris sits. I think all these challenges and opportunities um, are things that we can support you with as a bank. And today, all we are looking to do is sort of to start a conversation, to say that these are some of the things, and even if they may appear abstract, we are open to walk the journey with you to sort of break them down. And a number of your bankers will be here even after this conversation. But without much ado, I'd just like to open it up for Q&A at this point. Um, so if you have any questions for Gulam and also for the panelists, now is the time. If you have any questions online as well. I think we do have a number of microphones. Um, this, if we could just get a microphone over to that table. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, doctor said the long run we die, but until we die, we need to navigate the risks and the environment we live in. Thank you so much to our panelists, and uh, like Daisy mentioned, there are a couple of um, microphones around. Also to our online audience, we request that you slot in your questions on the chat. Otherwise, we can take it away. I think there's a microphone with uh, Liana. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, my question was to Jocelyn, um, particularly from the ESG side and what you I think in the in extractive industry, uh, just as you mentioned, what is the balance that you have to strike when interest rates are rising, but you still have to keep your ESG concerns for your business uh, balanced out for, for purposes of your uh, keeping your business going? Let me to answer right away. Okay. I propose we pick three questions and then we do the, the responses. Um, thank you very much to the panelists and thank you to uh, Stanbic for organizing this event. Um, my name is Joel. I'm Joel Basoga. I'm the head of technology at uh, H&G Advocates. And I've really enjoyed the discussion and I appreciate um, some of the points that were made, specifically on the importance of ESG and also traceability. But also from the field in which I practice law, but also as a sub-segment of it, um, I think uh, the discussion also 
uh, and this is what I'm curious to hear from the panelists, what are your insights on the uh, general developments in technology? Because um, even outside this room and in this room, there's been you know, rapid advancements, especially in terms of technologies that process data, that are able to increase outputs, especially when you are processing financial information for credit scoring. And I'm just curious to hear from, you know, from the regulator's perspective, but also from um, the practitioners here. What do you see as the role of technology um, and what insights can you offer uh, to the audience, especially as we think about what the market standing is? Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is Aileen Nsima. I'm a portfolio manager with Sunlam Investments, uh, Uganda. Uh, my question is directed to Dr. Mugume. Uh, we are at a pivotal time in the country, as we have seen in the different discussions we've had, um, where we could take advantage of the opportunities uh, to accelerate our growth faster. However, there are certain key challenges we've also highlighted. My question is in regards to the bumpiness that you have mentioned in your last remarks, what are some of those bumps that you foresee from where you sit um, as director of research and how are we going to navigate them so that our medium term looks as optimistic as you say it is? Thanks. We can take those maybe. I think we can take those. Can we start with you, Dr. Adam, or can we start with you? Um, on the question of what, what do we see as a technological development in our field is a good, uh, is a challenge. Uh, we, we deal with fintechs, for example, and we see is an area, as a central bank, uh, to be sincere, we are ignorant of, we are also learning in the sense they are moving much faster than the central bank. They are offering loans, for example, which we, we don't capture. The fintech loans, we don't capture the, in our usual data. So when we talk about private sector credit, it excludes such a kind of fintech lending. So is one of the areas, for example, we, we are grappling with how really do we uh, take, uh, take on board whatever they are doing. But we're also seeing a lot of innovation, for example, now we are all in artificial intelligence, whether it is data analytics. Uh, actually, now we are being challenged. We need to do to look at traditional ways of getting information, at the surveys, uh, looking at whatever. Can we use uh, AI, big data analytics, and AI, and come up with estimates about GDP? And that's what we are grappling with. And I think this is the way to go. Uh, uh, and uh, we're already seeing uh, that coming in, uh, on board on, on, or in, in the area, and we believe that is, we are still learning. And we are grappling with how do you regulate these developments in, uh, in technology? Uh, they are moving very fast. You don't need to kill them. You need to encourage them in terms of innovation and help. But they also, remember, they also cause challenges in the, in, in the industry with uh, cyber tax and security issues, ETC. So those are the issues really we are grappling with, uh, with uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a regulator. On the question what do we see uh, in, as a bumper road ahead, one of the issues uh, is, for example, as from the central bank perspective, we see that our reserves because of rate service have come down. And so with less reserves, now we are standing at around 3.3 .3 billion we use, uh, dollars worth around three months of import cover. We are coming from 4.8 or so months of import cover. And we know the challenge has been uh, we are having debt service, as I said, 1.3 billion this year, 1.2 last year. And uh, our ability to buy the dollars from the market has been constrained by the global developments. Because when the, U, the, uh, when the global interest rates were high, portfolio exited. And so how then do we build uh, reserves to make sure that we have sufficient reserves in the case of a currency run 
you, are able, you have the muscles to go into the market. That's why now we are talking about going into purchase of, the, of gold as a method of, reserve, of to cushion ourselves. So we, for example, we have started the, a program of gold purchase from the local miners so that we can have gold as part of our reserves, what we call monetary, monetary gold. So, but it all comes from, you have a uh, high debt service, but then you don't have enough reserves to, uh, to support you. What do you do in the case when the currency is really uh, volatile? So that's one of the, uh, of the bump we are seeing. The other bump is we are living in, the, as I said, where all of a sudden you can have a trade restriction from our, your neighbor. Kenya, let me be sincere, Kenya has been one of, of the countries that gives us, give us a, a, a bloody beating. When they cut no milk, no egg, and then you have eggs that are, are rotting at the border, and remember you have regional integration, what do you do? So, and that's why we are talking about industrial policy. So those are some of the bumps that we see, and they are likely uh, to increase with uh, different uh, uh, political developments within the region. Another big a big market where we export our goods is DRC. Last year, I think we, uh, we exported goods worth around 800 million to DRC, actually high, much higher than Kenya. And you know the volatile environment in DRC. And we are exporting semi-manufactured goods and some of agricultural produce. So in the event that you have a bit of continued uh, volatility in the eastern part of DRC, that is another bump we are talking about. So all those, really, that's what I'm saying, the road ahead is the bumpy, but I think we can maneuver through uh, with, uh, you know, different policy measures as we, as we proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mugume. Jocelyn, if you could please take the question in ESG. Okay. But I wanted to also add a little bit on the technology aspects and how we're seeing it in industry uh, before I go to the ESG one. So on the technology side, I'll give the most hot, hot um, topic, I think, that we've had, which is IFRS. Um, for, so if you're an industrial player like some of us, you know, we've had to, from a compliance point of view, put in a lot of investment in order to enable, you know, IFRS compliance. And in that investment, you start off with, you have to have an ERP system because they require a system-to-system -system integration. Literally, the way it works is before an invoice can be fiscalized, it will be able, the system will be able to go and look into your inventory. Do you actually have the stock to sell? So if you don't have the stock, when the invoice is being processed, there will be no fiscalization and then you are not compliant. So just from that alone, so what we're seeing is that from a regulatory point of view, we're being propelled into this environment where historically, as a manufacturer, you probably could get away without an ERP and do some things manually. But if you're entering into this space and you want to be compliant or you have to be compliant, then you know, some of those technological things come in. The last piece I'll give you as an example is, again, as industrialists, you go out you know, to put a plant in place or machines in place. What we're seeing now is a lot of those machines coming from overseas, of course, because we don't make machines in Uganda, unfortunately, um, are coming very automated. Um, this week, I was sharing earlier with Daisy, I think, about one of our machines was down, and the first thing that our supplier told us was, get it online, give me any desk ask, uh, access, and let me start doing the diagnostics and troubleshooting from Taiwan. Um, the benefit with that, of course, is that you quickly get um, you know, solutions. You don't have to now fly someone that's highly skilled all the way from Taiwan to come here. That would take you a couple of days. But then when they come here in, in the past, then they would do the diagnostics. Then you have to then think about what parts are required to repair, so another lead time issue. So there's a, a quick benefit there that you can move faster. On the downside, though, is you know our people are not ready. Our education system is not ready to give us the talent that is needed to work on some of these highly automated and, and highly specialized. So you're, you're seeing in future a high risk of high um, dependency, you know, depending on where you're sourcing from. So a lot of interesting things in that sense um, to think about. On the ESG side, the gentleman asked about this balancing act. 
Um, the truth of the matter is, if you are to stay competitive, given what I started off with earlier on, I said, you know, we're having regulatory pressures. I talked about NEMA. You're having, you know, um, uh, issues around financing. When you go to finance, the voice is getting louder. What's your ESG strategy? You're having um, cases of customers. We talked about the EU market, but even, you know, locally for some of us who will participate in the tenders. So, in a way, it's no longer um, a nice to have. It's no longer at your, you know, leisure yes. to do something. You, you actually have to do something. And then, of course, the last one is simply that you want to be a good corporate citizen. So the, the reality is the first thing is you map out what are the things that in your um, business, what is your environmental footprint looking like? What can I start with? What's my journey and tell that story around there? But inevitably, ESG is here. It's not going anywhere. The voices are from all over and you just have to get on with it, literally. Thanks, thanks, thanks Jocelyn. We have a question coming in for Gulam. I hope he's online. But even before then, when you were speaking about technology, I think one of the conversations that we've had before is that if you are a manufacturer and you have a machine of some type or kind, we're moving into a space where your machine will break down and because the rest of the world has moved on from a technology perspective, you can't even access the after cells, you can't access the spare parts. So it's important that as the rest of the world moves, you move along because you'll be left with machines that can't be serviced because everybody else has closed that chapter. Having said that, um, I don't know if Gulam is on. There's a question here for him. To Gulam, what are one or two major policy shifts that the East Africa region should focus on to best position herself for this changing landscape? Did you get that? Thank you for that. I hope you can hear me. So my response would be to feverishly focus on human capital and infrastructure. In other words, upskilling society and especially the youth with regard to modern day technologies as much as they may be fast moving. Yeah. The second related dynamic to citizenship and skills is to bear in mind in the manner in which much of Africa with emphasis on East Africa has bypassed fixed line telephony and rapidly embraced mobile telephones and mobile telephony in turn, catalyzing a whole raft of ancillary technologies and services. So for example, just by way of anecdote, rural incomes in Kenya have been lifted occasionally in excess of 30% simply as a function of M-Pesa. And this is long-standing. And so that gives additional indirect and induced impact to the rural economy. Telemedicine, teleeducation, and the ability to export services from the region to the rest of the world, from the most low level of, for example, um, call centers, but also, for instance, coding, AI generation, content editing, these are all very distributed technologically levered services. And then the second item I mentioned was infrastructure, but an infrastructure that connects East Africa even more than it is now. We celebrate East Africa as one, is the most, one of the most integrated regions in the continent, indicatively, whereas many people will highlight intra-Africa trade is around 15, 16%, meaning that only 15 to 16% of Africa's trade is with itself. The remainder is between Africa and the rest of the world. But in East Africa, intra-regional trade amongst the region is in the order of 45 to 50%, speaking to the already established integratedness of its trade and its financial flows and just general services. And I think that offers room for extension in terms of harnessing the intra-regional strength for scaling services and exports in the region for then further amplification and exports into the rest of Africa. So when I talk about infrastructure, network infrastructure, that is transportation lines, rail, and digital networks that are already well established, but where there is room for further bolting on extension. 
I think will be very catalytic. And I'll just conclude by saying, typically every one dollar or shilling that is invested in infrastructure translates into a multiplier of, at the minimum, three. In other words, over a 20 horizon, a dollar of spending on constructive infrastructure can generate annually three dollars of additional GDP buoyancy. So it's truly bang for your buck. I'll pause there. Thank you. There's a follow-on for Gulam. What sectors do you think will benefit most out of the shifts you've mentioned? Our customers would like to know the next frontiers of growth. So this may sound a little bit primitive in the sense that maybe people are expecting me to again talk about the frontiers of technology. But I suspect that agriculture offers a very significant opportunity in a world where there's increasing hunt for food security and some very vulnerable areas, not just the Middle East, but also in the Far East, that requires growing food security. So I think irrigation of Did we lose him? Gulam, I think we lost you. Technology. This is why you must pay attention to technology. <laughs> okay, I think we'll leave it there. Are there any questions online, Ken? Thank you. Have we all gone off? No, I'm here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to you all. My name is Jonathan Tugume. I am uh, a contractor. I run a company called Dynaco Limited and we are into infrastructure, uh, building bridges. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, the last uh, submission from Gulam is that uh, infrastructure will, uh, will uh, give a good return for every dollar that we spend. But also earlier on, uh, we learned that uh, because of the squeeze, uh, governments are going to spend less on infrastructure. Uh, each of you can see that uh, our own government is spending less on road maintenance, for example. And this is because a lot of the money is being used to, to take care of other priority areas like, uh, like debt repayment. But we have also learned that much of the debt is because some of the infrastructure, like the oil roads that were done a few years ago, uh, that debt is coming to maturity. And so we have to pay. So it's a cycle. Now, I'm a contractor and we are stuck with a lot of unpaid money with the government. That unpaid money is actually money that is uh, borrowed from, from the banks, from Stanbic. And uh, now we have bridges and roads that cannot be crossed because they are very old. And also climate change, you know, floods are washing away bridges. You cannot go to northern Uganda because Karuma has got an advisory. Sezibwa on the eastern side of Uganda has an advisory. It's cut off. Uh, you cannot go to the west because Katonga is under construction. If we have any further emergencies, we are all... In trouble and I'm sure you also see in your neighborhoods the roads are very bad because the road maintenance budget is under squeeze oh. so what do we do and these things we used to think were problems of engineers now as I learned they are problems of finance and economists like the guys in this room you cause us the problems because if I cannot get access for example now to credit because maybe the bank is feeling a bit uncomfortable uh, I have so much money unpaid and so I can't do the next project So, and I'm not being paid and interest rates are going up. We are also having many of the local contractors closing shop. And I think you can see that on your non-performing uh, loans. Mm. So, we are all connected. What can we do as a bank, big bank like Stanbic, uh, the regulator is here. What can you do to solve these problems. Especially if I do work and I'm a contractor and the work is certified, 
That means the government is enjoying the beneficial, you know, use and uh, benefits of my bridge and they are driving over it, but I'm not paid. Oh. What can you do to get... Because I see all the time you buy uh, government instruments. Oh. You are willing to buy a uh, government of Uganda bond, but you cannot buy the debt related to a bridge that has been built. I think there's a disconnect. Mm. And eventually, jobs are being lost, employment is being killed, contractors who could actually help you in future to deal with the debt burden, because uh, after all this, I finish now. After all this infrastructure is neglected for a long time, about five years from now, you will rush to borrow more money from the East because the contractors will come with contractor-facilitated finance. Oh. So let's see what we can do with what we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so uh, this much. This was a question, and it's also an ESG. Uh, so both of you could uh, come in. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think on the last part about how banks can look to support uh, the type of development work that you're doing, even borrowing from Gulam's illustrated on illustration on the return on any dollar invested in infrastructure. I think that we will allow Dr. Mugume to sort of comment on the cost of borrowing that has sort of come down. But also from a bank perspective, and some of my colleagues could help me on this, we, have, we are exploring some, we are having conversations around how we can discount some of the work that you've actually already done even as we wait for government to come through with payments. As it is, we must remain partners of the government. So we are having conversations, and it's something that we can further with you to discount some of the work that you've actually already done. Uh, maybe Dr. Mugume can, can, can round it up on the cost of debt generally, highlighting recent CBR cuts and the like. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right that we, uh, the, uh, the cost of money, the lending interest rates have been one of the structural impediments in, in Uganda. Actually, now we are talking about, now the average lending interest rate is around 17, weighted around 17 point uh, for there. But traditionally, it has been above 20. So all, at least we have seen a gradual uh, movement downwards. Live mm. around the easing of monetary policy, but some of the causes of high lending interest rates I do have a structural, a structural in nature, like, for example, the legal perspective, if you take a course for arbitration, sorry, a case for arbitration, how long does it take to, uh, to get resolved? Those are many years down the road. Then you have government that comes to borrow from the same market uh, at, uh, you know, at, at say 16%. Uh, so if you're a contractor and the government is borrowing at 16 and the governments live forever, but for you, you have uh, a short lifespan. So the question is, so the free rate plus a premium of the fact that your company can go under, so you are charged the 20%. So basically, so if the government borrowing also comes down, the premium beneath the remain is at least the learning interest rates have come down. So overall, I think learning interest rate is both structural in nature, but also monetary policy, and we agree that some of the efforts we are taking in terms of easing monetary policy will, fi uh, will fit us through into lending interest rates. Thank you so much. Um, I think we've come, okay, just we'll take one more. Um, it's still morning, yes. Good morning, um, my name is Rosa Malango. I'm the chairperson of the Tumaini African Knowledge Center, which I recently founded. And part of my focus is on mobilizing high net worth partners with their own technology to bring their technology and their financing to Uganda. So right now, um, I'm working with uh, two partners. One of them is bringing uh, e-mobility technology, at Spiral, uh, with a commitment to produce and manufacture in Uganda in the next 18 months, create about 5,000 jobs, and bring 250 million into the economy. The second one is on integrated industrial platforms. Now, First, I want to say thank you, Stanbeck. This is a very timely discussion um, as we try to mobilize more investment into the country. And as a country, I believe, is discussing its next development plan, I think. There were two things that I wanted to hear from uh, the panelists, which I was not sure if I caught. The first one was on the workforce. Because I hear there's a new technology. We understand the geopolitical shifts. 
We understand we have to figure out how to do both energies. I hear you, I agree on that. But how do we redefine the workforce that we need so that as we're creating these opportunities and bringing these jobs online, it will actually be the young Ugandans who get employed um, going forward. And we don't continue to have unemployment high despite the fact that some of us are bringing in FDI. So your views on redefining the workforce and any impact on the industrial policy would be really appreciated. Um, the second thing that I wanted to hear a bit more is your views on the impact of technology on the manufacturing and service sectors in Uganda. Uganda is trying to position itself as the MICE hub, even though I know Kenya is also trying to do that. Um, but with new technologies coming in, both done indigenously by our youth, but also being brought in by FDI. Where are we on it? How do you see that playing a role in terms of the GDP that we need to generate in the next decade? Thank you. Thanks. Jasmine, do you want to take the question on workforce? Yes, um, I will. And I, sorry, I will probably borrow from experience that I had. Um, I had the good fortune to work for an engine manufacturer called Cummins in Nigeria. And uh, together with my team, we actually championed an initiative around um, setting up a, a TVET with uh, other companies such as Siemens. So what we did is we recognized that um, the readiness of the workforce um, and sort of the curriculum that was in place was not in sync with what we needed. And um, basically, again, coming from your side, you know, investors, including ourselves, even the ones that are already in place, we actually have a responsibility to work with the um, education sector in really informing you know, that curriculum so that it actually comes out um, to be relevant for what we need. So specifically, one of the things that Cummins did was it shipped actually engines um, from other um, areas in the world into Nigeria. And those engines were you know, used engines, but really to, to really support the technical institutions so that the students were aware in the, their curriculum about the type of um, you know, um, tools and, and sort of skills they needed to, to equip themselves with. And then obviously the other piece was around training the trainers. We did that uh, with our Johannesburg office at the time. So in a nutshell, it has to be a partnership between you know, industry or investors together with the ministry because ultimately the curriculum has to be informed and, and you know, if you're moving very fast on the other side, you really have to work with them to support that, that aspect. So I think it's just really, you know, a, a lot of proactive initiative and investment. I don't know if that's satisfactory, but I agree with you. Um, we need to pay some focus to our education system. Um, if there being no other questions. Um. Uh, hello. So we're wrapping up the Q&A and we have one question online for Chris. Um, it says, does China's increased investment in Africa pose several risks? Um, how can countries in East Africa ensure that these investments are sustainable in the long term? And how can we minimize the likely negative effects of increased China investment, like economic dependence, <laughs> corruption, governance, political influence, and debt dependence? To my mind, I think it goes back to, I think, uh, Gulam's presentation um, where he talked about investing in um, institutional uh, reform. I, I believe that that will be one way that we can um, ad address uh, that influence that China is, 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 is making towards um, East Africa, and the, the reason why I say that, while I think government policy will decide which, whether they want to face East or West, uh, but when you have strong institutions, uh, you'll be able to limit uh, any undue influence. Um, I think we do need, um, our region does need investment from the East and also from the West. Uh, but investment in human capital, investment in um, attracting capital into our, our economies and also strengthening institutions, um, I think over time will, will address um, 
I think that the question that was posed. Um, I, I believe that uh, strong institutions should help uh, to ensure that we have steady and stable growth uh, over a long period of time. Thank you, Adam. I think we will close it here. I'd like to give my special thanks to our dear panelists and to Gulam, who is online. I know that there's still a number of questions coming through, but our commitment and our ask of your time was only up to 11 o'clock. So I'm going to ask that we close here. We will continue the conversation and the questions online, and a number of us are in the room to support with any other questions that you may have. So thank you for now, and a very good rest of your day. Very hearty congratulations to our panelists, Chris, Jocelyn, and Dr. Mgume, and our moderator, Daisy. We much appreciate. I believe we've had a very nice deliberation. I ask you guys one more round of applause for them because they've done a very good job.